From its foundation, the city of Memphis favored worship of the god Ta. The main temple of Ta was known as Hutkapta, meaning palace of the Ka of Ta. The name of the temple, translated into Greek as Egyptos, would eventually evolve into the modern name Egypt. Temples were the center of religious, political, and economic life in ancient Egypt. These sacred places were viewed as the literal home of the gods and goddesses. As such, every aspect of them required care and reverence, all of which was accomplished through elaborate ritual. Located in the center of Memphis, the Temple of Ta was the most prominent and imposing building in the city. The long walkway leading toward the temple, known as the Dromos, was guarded by rows of sphinxes. The entire sacred area was designed to keep the statue of the god protected deep within the sacred enclosures that surrounded it. The Dromos opened into a courtyard with the surrounding portico graced with columns carved to resemble palm trees. During special festivals, the general population was allowed to enter this location, but under no circumstances would they be allowed into the sacred spaces beyond the courtyard. The Memphis Alabaster Sphinx was discovered in 1912, almost completely buried in water and sand. Eight meters in height and weighing in at roughly 90 tons, it is still mounted on its original pedestal. Though it is called the Alabaster Sphinx, it was in fact carved from common calcite rock, which is similar in appearance and texture to alabaster. Erosion has destroyed the original engravings, making it difficult to determine when it was created. Egyptologists believe that its facial likeness resembles Amenhotep II, and so it could have been sculpted somewhere between 1700 and 1400 BCE. It is believed that this monument once stood outside of the Temple of Ta and was integrated into subsequent extensions to the complex. The size of the imposing sculpture reflects the importance it had to the temple during the New Kingdom. This Sphinx is one of the few remaining artifacts from the ruins of Memphis to survive. In Egyptian culture, some animals were associated with gods, while others were considered to be living gods. The Apis bull was believed to be a divine entity. The earliest mention of the Apis bull in ancient Egypt goes back as far as the first Egyptian dynasty. Originally the symbol of fertility, the Apis bull was linked to the god Ra with the image of the sun carried between its horns. Later it was associated with Osiris, the ruler of the underworld, thus becoming the funerary divinity Osoropis. During the 18th dynasty in Memphis, the Apis bull's association with the city's deity earned it the title Herald of Ta. The Apis bull was so revered that even Alexander the Great, upon his arrival in Memphis, gave honor to Apis. The Apis bull lived with its harem in a sacred barn located in an enclosure in the Temple of Ta. Each bull bore 29 signs representative of its divinity. Among them, the bull had an eagle-shaped mark on its back, a double tail hair, and a scarab-shaped mark under the tongue. The signs were intended to correspond with the lunar cycle. After its death, Egyptians would search for its reincarnated form among the livestock. Like other living divinities, the mortal incarnation of the Apis bull was prayed to, and when it died, it was given a luxurious funeral, which included mummification. Until the reign of Ramses II, the Apis bulls were buried in individual graves in Saqqara. During the 26th dynasty, the bodies of the bulls were buried in enormous stone vats in the underground corridors of the Serapium of Memphis. Ancient Egyptians believed that temple rituals were essential to maintain order in the cosmos and allow communication between humans and gods. The pharaoh was required to bring offerings as part of a twofold promise made to the gods. 
to remain a just ruler and to prevent chaos from entering Egypt. Details of the ceremonies found on temple walls provide a thorough overview of the stages of the daily ritual. Performed three times a day to mirror human mealtimes, each step of the highly symbolic ceremony was accompanied by specific recitations, many of which referred to mythical events. The high priest would first awaken the sleeping god with a chant. Then the seals of the shrine's doors were broken and the bolts drawn back. The act of swinging open the doors was a symbolic gesture where sight was granted to the deity. The priest would then bow and kiss the ground. The god was then washed with incense-infused water and its mouth rinsed with mineral salts. The cleansing was followed by adorning the statue with jewels and royal garments. The final ritual required the priest to sweep away any footprints in order to prevent evil from approaching the god. Heredity was the primary source of new recruits. Rarely was an outsider allowed this position. At the top of the temple hierarchy was the high priest. Each temple dedicated to a god had at least one high priest devoted to its care and service. During the Ptolemaic dynasty, one family held the position of high priest in Memphis for almost 300 years. High priest candidates made their way up the ranks of the temple hierarchy. The one chosen to occupy the lofty position of high priest was usually confirmed by the pharaoh. Several of the high priests were also important officials in the government. Families sharing the highest priesthood titles tended to make many alliances, thereby gaining more land and wealth. Shifting balances of power sometimes resulted in more or less open conflicts between the priesthood and the pharaohs. In the 21st dynasty, Thebes became the capital of an almost entirely theocratic government. The city was headed by king priests who spoke and governed in the name of the god Amun, in open opposition to the ruling pharaohs. These king priests caused a massive decentralization of power known as the Third Intermediate Period. The educational institution in ancient Egypt was known as the House of Life. Attended by the offspring of the elite and the clergy, it was a place tailored to the social status of its attendees. The earliest references to this type of institution date back to royal decrees of the Old Kingdom. Only two known centers have been uncovered, one in the abandoned city of Akhetaten and one at the temple of Ramses II on the west bank of Thebes. Inscriptions uncovered in those locations mention the names and titles of people who were connected with the House of Life, such as a chief physician and many scribes. It is presumed that by the late kingdom, every temple had a House of Life. The House of Life offered training for the elite destined for occupations such as astronomers, doctors, veterinarians, diplomats, architects, translators, or theologians. Some institutions focused on specific disciplines, making them a central hub for the country. Not limited to instruction for young students, the House of Life was a source of reference for many scholars with rooms dedicated to papyri of many disciplines. Because papyri were preserved there, the Greco-Romans referred to the House of Life as a library. Ancient Egyptian economy was based on an unequal system of redistribution of goods. The state of Egypt collected the crops and the temples distributed them throughout the provinces. Since the only people capable of counting and ensuring a fair redistribution were the educated scribes, this meant that the temples played a pivotal role in this process. There are records of pharaohs making offerings of large tracts of land and animals to temples in order to maintain their favor. Ramses III offered generous gifts to the temple of Amun in Karnak in such a manner. 
Palaces, warehouses, and granaries were built inside the temple compound to better control the redistribution of goods. The size of the recorded numbers of goods, combined with every other function filled by temples, only serves to confirm their might as economic, religious, and political centers of power within Egypt. Mm -hmm. 